Well, finally, you can find a sugar daddy, a sponsor who will patron, patronise the standard and pay for it. Usually the sponsor is known as the government. But the trouble with the sponsor option is that the person paying for the process eventually decides they're paying for control over the process. Right, that happened to standards, healthcare standards in Australia. There is no healthcare IT standard process in Australia today because there was three years ago and the government decided that gave it the right to tell the standards process what to do. The consequence was the standards process collapsed. We have none now. And it's becoming quite an issue. So how are you going to fund your standards? It's, it's a challenge, right? And what is an open standard? Okay, so I, you give the standard away so anybody in the world can use it, but someone's now bought control of it. Is it an open standard? What is an open standard? These are not easy answers. Okay. Now, if you roll back five years ago, HL7 is an organisation which is the primary organisation for defining data standards. HL7 was stuck. We had started with a healthcare standard called version two, which is used in every hospital just about in the world now, and it's used for exchanging basic administrative data about healthcare. And, and its heritage dates back to the um, record standard, record exchange standards defined in the 70s. And it was defined in the very early 80s, and it's frozen by its own maintenance rules to be structurally what was capable of in the early 80s. Right? And we've, we've explored the nooks and crannies and, and we've taken it as far as we possibly can and the Word documents crash all the time because they're full of old stuff from 1980s and yeah, it's not, it's not a fun process. And, and not only is it hard to write, it's hard to read and it's hard to use, you can't leverage it. Everybody has to write custom parses and nobody can write them correctly. It's a, it's a bad thing. But that's what most people are using. So back in the, and, and it's a mess. As a standard, it's a mess because 30 years ago, we didn't have a clue how to think about information. We had 36 generations of learning about information that were not reflected in the standard. So in the early 90s, HL7 said, right, we can see that that's a dead end. It's got maybe two or three years max left back in the early 90s, and we're going to start again. And they wrote a field of dreams and said, we're going to do this really ambitious thing where we're going to have layers of information, everything modelled perfectly, all related together, and we're going to use UML, and we're going to use XML and schema, and, and we'll have this amazing crystal clear um, information model on which all exchange will be based. Uh, actually, in the end, we gave up. It's too ambitious. People don't think that way. People don't know how to make it work. If you had the resources of a nation state, somewhere between five and ten billion dollars, you probably had enough money to make it work. But, but it took 12 years to get to the realisation that that's where we were heading. And of course, two or three nation states did spend that much money to make it work. And they didn't enjoy the process and everybody else said, no, we're not going to do that. And, and so there we were stuck with a standard that was old and regarded as too old by 1990, mid-90s, a new standard that had failed and had the failure had become um, unignorably clear by late you know, 2008, 2009, and no other options, and any fool could look at the overall industry and go, well, where's interoperability going? We're going to have an absolute deluge of interoperability associated with the mobile and the web and the, you know, the whole back-end data integration space. And there's no options. And so the consequence was much frustration and, and pain. And we were starting to see a proliferation of standards efforts. That's a, really, that's a really good sentence to hear. A proliferation of standards efforts should make everybody happy, that sentence. Not. But I had spent 10 years at this point trying to make this stuff work, trying to simplify it enough to the point where it would work. But, but early on in the process of defining a standard, you get locked into a particular technical path and it, it's going to work or it's not. And, and that's all there is to it. You can't 
you, these are not ships that you can change course in the middle of the in the ocean. That they, they're going that way, and that's all there is to it. So, just a little bit about economics of healthcare standards. A, a typical healthcare standard defines an economic space with a value north of five hundred billion dollars. Okay, now the standard itself is not worth that, but the space that it defines is going to have that much money poured into it by doing projects. So, let's take an example. There's a national healthcare records project here in Australia, which has cost roughly a billion dollars. I mean, you can add or take zeros away from that and probably be as accurate as the politicians, they don't really know, but neither do my employer, who, um, who is actually responsible for it. I was the clinical document lead on it. Um, how much money is spent is a very definitional question, but a but billion dollars is what you would typically hear in the news. If, if we, and it was built on a particular standard which I wrote, um, or I was chair of the committee that wrote, if you pull that from the bottom and replace it in another standard, then all of the assumptions written into the standard change. And so everything, it's like pulling the foundation block, everything falls down in a hole, and all that money gets to be spent again. Okay, so, so when you think about committing to a standard, you've got to think about How's the standard governed? Will we have, will, we, will our billion dollar investment be protected? And lots and lots of projects across the world make that size investments or larger. And, and so what I say to the guys in my team and girls in my team is, when you think about what we're doing, you've got to think about minimum spend in our ecosystem of $500 billion. And we've got to act like that's a good investment. <coughs> So five years ago, I sat down and said, you don't lightly create a new standard. In fact, you really, really do your best to avoid adding new standards, right? Um, there's an XKCD cartoon I was going to offer you at this point where um, some of you all have seen it. I see a couple of you have. It says there's 14 standards. He says, well, let's make a new standard that combines them all. And the next thing we'll have 15 standards. And, and so you really think really hard about standards. But... Five years ago, I sat and looked at the overall ecosystem and said, you know what, it's fail. It's, we've come to the end of the road. We can't make the one that we're working on work. It's never going to happen. We can't keep going with the old standard. It's, it just hasn't got the legs to do what has happened in the other industries. It was already clear what would happen five years ago. There is no hope. It's time to do a new standard. So I sat down and said, let's, let's start again. And, and create a new standard. And I said, obviously we'll use the web. Pretty clear we'll be restful. Um, needs to be open standard, whatever that means. I'll come back to that. And, and then, so I, I drafted one. Drafted an outline of one, the shape of what it would be internally, what it would look like as a standards project. Because I was kind of pretty deeply embedded in the standards process. <clears throat> and then I took it to the organization said, well, what about this? And I pretty much expected to get thrown out because it was very much <coughs> um, an organisation that was deeply committed to a failing process. So very much lots of emperor with no clothes stuff going on in the organisation, lots of denial of reality, um, lots and lots of politics, everything that you would expect to follow from that. It, that was where I was. And I took that to the organisation expecting to get thrown out of the organisation. Uh, it was really a palace revolution. Um, led by, you know, one of the lieutenants. <clears throat> uh, much to my surprise, everybody jumped on board and said, right, this is the future. And, and so five years later, um, the FIRE project, the standard FIRE, which is Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, just demonstrates how hard it is to find a globally unique acronym. But we have a globally unique acronym and it's way cool. Because as soon as people hear FHIR, they can find out everything about us. It's really cool. So FIRE is the standard that I invented. Now, I didn't realise how big it was going to be. Um, <clears throat> when I go to healthcare events, I have, to, I have to be careful not to go out in public too much. It's, it's nuts. It's just stupid. Um, but we created this um, standard, which is pretty much uniformly considered now the future of healthcare data exchange. And we have... Um, already had more than a billion dollars spent 
on the using implementing with the standard. And we haven't even actually published a formal version yet. <coughs> All right. So now I'll tell you a little bit about this. This is an open standard. So fire is two things. It's there's two parts to the fire project that are un they're twined together and inseparable. The first is um, the standard process, formal, um, accountable to the US government um, and to the International Standards Organization with very formal governance processes that's subject to a ballot cycle so that anybody can vote on the standard and approve the standard. And, and we have, yeah, all of the standards process. That's one part of the project. The other part of the project is an, a classic open source project run using open source infrastructure, Subversion and GitHub and all those kind of things. And that is merit-based election of committers. And the committers write the tools that run, that produce a standard. And the committers also write implementation tooling that anybody who uses the standard will pick up and use in, with our implementation tooling. So it's those two things tied together. <coughs> okay. Rotate, then I can see you. Okay. So, so the, the tooling part, we use classic open source licenses, BSD, Apache 2 for most, for most of those, most of the code. And that code is run extremely widely. Um, <coughs> so code that I write as being one of the maintainers of the spec, code that I write is picked up and run by hundreds of implementers, hundreds of healthcare systems around the world. Some have actually gone into production and we're talking mobile phones all the way through to massive cloud-based systems. It's an amazing thing to happen. Okay, but the standard, the license of the standard is a big question. <clears throat> okay, so when I started this process, my, my reasoning was I want an open standard, whatever that means. An open standard to me means two things. Anybody can use it without any kind of restriction to hold them back from using it. Now, if you look at any kind of software, license, Apache, BSD, they come with obligations. You must at least conserve the license statement, the copyright statement. You might have to do certain things around how to use the code. If you look at any standard, they'll come with restrictions. You cannot, and they're all concerned about control of the IP and control of the right to distribute the content because that is a fundamental value proposition of the standard. And, and so, most people, for instance, say you, I don't know, read the HTML standard. And from the HTML standard, you generated a schema, and then you distributed the schema. You just broke W3C copyright. W3C are really good about not pursuing that, but it happens all the time. Their license statements are pretty clear about that. All right, so, and yet that's what everybody does. Now, other standards organizations are not so understanding as W3C including HL7 historically, which had a habit of sending nasty letters to people going, hey, we see you're using our standard. Where's your membership? Got to be a member. That's worth a million dollars a year to the organization, which is a million dollars more to work on standards. It's a not-for-profit. It didn't make for happy members, but it made for happy standards writers. So <clears throat> what I wanted was a standard that had no restrictions. You could generate code from the spec and distribute the generated code to other people, and then they could bind them into their binaries and produce them with no restrictions. Well, that's real open, right? But I also wanted an open standard, which meant that it wasn't controlled by any particular individuals. And in the end, the control of a particular individual is asserted by legal rights or financial, well, um, financial muscle. So it was really, really important to me that nobody could assert copyright control over the standard. So when we published it, we actually wrote our own license. Because if you look through the standards, standard open source licenses, the OSI initiative licenses, none of them do anything like what I wanted. Right? They're all concerned about software. And we're fine to use those for software. They're not rel at all relevant for um, a standard. And if you go and look at the OSI rules for an open standard, 
They don't know what a proper licence for an open standard is. They know what the criteria are, which is a bit different to mine, but they don't know what the they don't know what the, the how to do that. Right? They just make a big hole in the ground saying, open standards, we like the idea, have never seen one. So we wrote our own licence and I'm going to read you what we wrote. Fire is copyright HL7. The right to maintain fire remains vested in HL7. I can't avoid that restriction, right? Someone's got to own it and maintain it. You can redistribute it. You can create derivative specifications or implementation related products or services. There's no restrictions there. Um, you cannot redefine what fire is, but you can, you can use it in any way. And you can't claim that HL7 or any of its members endorses your derived thing because of its, it uses content from this specification. That's just straight out of BSD3. And there's no liability accepted for your use of fire. Note there's nothing about patents. I'll come back to patents later. Because that was just something I wrote, right? And everybody looked at it and said, yeah, we buy into that. But it didn't have a legal statement associated with it. So I, I stole a legal copy statement. Uh, something's happening. Let's see if I can get the presentation then. Uh. Maybe, maybe not. Ah, here we go. All right. Okay. So then, so the, let's talk about the history of that. That's what I just read to you. Let's talk about the history of that license. So we borrowed the license statement that we, the formal license from OMG, which raised a really interesting point for me. What's the copyright on the copyright statement itself? Nobody ever says, nobody ever knows. It's kind of a funny question. But, and of course at this stage I was running around trying to rip off people's copyright licenses and, and wondering just whether they were happy with that or not. <clears throat> anyway, OMG, uh, Richard Soley from OMG very nicely gave me permission to use theirs. But it, I couldn't, I, I hacked it a little bit, but I, we didn't have money for lawyers. We're just an open source project. We didn't have lots of money for lawyers. That's what it was gonna require. And, and um, it didn't quite match what we said we wanted it to mean. And, and it wasn't a recognized open source license because I, I wrote it and it's not an OSI thing. And, and um, that allows for a great deal of fear and uncertainty and doubt from the people who wanted to create such. And it created legal costs for implementers because a few implementers actually had to get their legal department to review it and then I got on these big long discussions with lawyers and that wasn't very much fun at the best of times. So actually a friend of ours, the project lead for Open MRS, Open Medical Record System, uh, he arranged for us to have lawyer time at his cost to one of the top lawyers in the world on open source, a guy by the name of Larry Rosen, if any of you track open source licensing. Larry's a member, a board member of OSI. And Larry and I had a big long discussion about our plain English statement and what we were trying to achieve. And in the end, Larry said, really you should just license it under Creative Commons Zero, public domain. And so we did. Um, I took to HL7, which is the formal owning organisation, the proposal that we relicense fire instead of under our custom licence, under public domain. It's really interesting to be there, you know, because now in the, in the spread of open source licences, I stand over here and look across at, a, at Apache and Linux and go, can't quite see you over there, boys, you're not really open. You've got too many encumbrances. Whereas we're right over here. The public domain, no encumbrances at all. No license statements required. And that was important for me because it's a standard. Thousands of companies will be required to implement the standard. And we don't want them to have to say somewhere in the documentation, oh yes, we implemented some standard and we are acknowledging that. We didn't want that. It just generates pushback. So Creative Commons public domain. Now there was a whole lot of worry in the organisation when we did that. If we licensed the standard under public domain, there's nothing in the world to stop anybody in the world going, hey, I could do this better than HL7. I will. And start getting competitive um, publishers. And I'm not entirely sure I want to stop that. What we do is we protect the trademark, right? We protect the fire trademark. No one else can take the spec 
do that and call it fire, they can take the spec and rename it from to something else and then they can do whatever they want. And, and to me that's really important. The whole point of an open standard is the governance process is good and clear and transparent and nobody can get a lock on the, on the process and pervert the process. So, so that's what we were doing there is <coughs> by public domain, right? The standard is a public domain entity. Um, and, and there was a lot of worry in the organisation that we would become irrelevant because we could no longer maintain the thing because anybody could do it. In practice what happened in September 29, 2014 when the board finally agreed and passed the motion, <coughs> my life went nuts. <coughs> and I haven't slept, I think, since that day happened. Everybody wants in on a truly open standard because nobody can own it all there is is a transparent governance process. That's not to be taken for granted, man. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> Patent remains a tremendous problem for us. Right? The, the best thing I can say about patents is HL7 doesn't have a rigorously enforced patent agreement that you can't contribute to the standards unless you forego in advance your patent rights. Um, and we have many very, very large organisations that could not sign that and if we insisted that they sign it, they would walk away from the process. So we can't afford for them to walk away from the process. We can't afford for them to assert patents over the process either. The best thing I can say is all the contributions to the standard are made in public domain and become prior art the day they're made. It's almost impossible now to um, get a good patent on anything to do with restful use of, of the restful API in healthcare. Because we've public, we've public, um, put in the public domain a vast amount of prior art. Right, that's, that's the best I can say about patents. And, and actually a couple of our members have gone off and acquired patents and I've looked at their patents and gone, if that ever goes to court, I'll be in court um, producing out of our logs prior art till the sun comes home. <coughs> All right, so open standard. Free for anybody to use. Nobody can assert control over the process because it's public domain. And the governance process that we have is clear and transparent. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So to me, those are the criteria for an actual open standard. And, and you have to pay attention to governance and control, not the cost of distribution. <coughs> All right. Let's talk about XX, because there is none. We give the content away freely. And, and yet there's, and there's a huge number of people who benefit from the existence of a standard. Um, patients and consumers benefit, vendors benefit, healthcare providers benefit of all sorts, and government benefits. So who's gonna pay? After all, we organise the process so that no one can charge for the content and we organise the process so that no one can assert control over the content except for the community that people believe in. Well, where'd the value go? So that's the first rule about my project. My project is engaged in the wholesale destruction of value. Right? That's what we do. We destroy value. Um, actually, that's value that other people extract as rent and I'm happy about that, but we destroyed our own value as well while we're at it. So who pays for that? And in fact, quite a few of the participants, like one very large multinational, very, very large multinational, said to me that their evaluation of the FIRE project is that it will destroy their business. It's pretty much what I think too. They got 10 or 15 years, but we'll, we'll do away with that business model. They've got 10 or 15 years to create a new business model and they're working hell, hell of a hard on doing that. <clears throat> but who is it who pays for this? Where'd the value go? So it's a tragedy of the commons, who pays for this? And so that's a challenge that I have every day. There's about, you know, in, in the fire project, there's concentric rings, sort of the inner, the inner group, the committers who work full time on fire, who are paid for one way or another. Every one of us is struggling to to get a really solid paid thing. And I like that, you know, it shouldn't be easy. But it should be possible, that, that I don't like that it's not possible. And then around that we have another wider group, the editors. 
then the collaborators and the um, evangelists. And around that, we have the um, immediate implementation community. And then around that, we have the wider set of people who talk to us every week. And we're up to about one and a half thousand people in the community now. So it's a nice big project that we have. And in the end, the best source of funding is twofold. We, the, the core key people have mostly contracts from governments, pretty easy, well-paying contracts on the basis that they can pretend that they're paying us for work, and they are paying us for work, but, but half the money goes to supporting the base, right? But they can't get their hands on the base, so that's kind of a bit hard to, for them to get their heads around. And then we have a bunch of vendor consortiums trying to do one thing or another who, who want us to do particular things so they can achieve goals. And they, they have the same arrangement with us where they, they pay us well on the basis that half of what we do isn't actually for them. OK. So going back to the healthcare industry, everybody who works in healthcare, everybody wants it to change. I haven't met anybody who said, I'm happy with how the system is. But everybody wants to change it differently, depending on their perspective. And there's no central authority to drive change. There's plenty of central authorities that are able to block change, but not to drive it. Um, at the moment, you can't transform the healthcare process because you can't share data. And until you can share data well, you're stuck. Our goal is to break that, break that nexus, to make it possible to share data to make it possible to go to the clinicians and the managers and the government bureaucrats and say, but you can have confidence that you can share data at not exorbitant costs. You're not going to lose 50% you know, of your budget into the hole called sharing data. And so our goal is to remove that block. How are we going? Well, in terms of a standard, we're sort of halfway through getting to the point of actually having a formally published standard. The, the standard is available if you go to hl7.org slash FHIR, which is in the slides, which I'll distribute. I'll talk to the conference guys about that. Um, if you go there, you'll see we're, we're in progress, right? We're about halfway through. Already we've got systems going into production. So that's conceptually equivalent to people going into production on a pre-draft, early committee draft of HTML. Does this make you feel good? But, but healthcare, people are doing that. Massive government projects going into production on a pre-committee draft because they're still the least worst option. And, and if you look in the media, um, you'll see that we are uniformly regarded by the herd as the future. There's still a few naysayers, and I, I pay a lot of attention to why they're saying no, but, but the herd as a whole, the media, the governments, the big vendors, are all saying fire is the future. And so that's really good, because the biggest risk of all to what we were doing was the whole XKCD thing, right? Now we've got 15 standards. Well, now what we're doing is we say, everybody's saying, hey, there's the one standard for the future. Everybody go to that standard. So we've got the herd with us. That's really good. And what, what's happening now is that we're having new discussions about new kinds of services, new kinds of data sharing that we couldn't have had in the past. So I'm working with a bunch of US multinational vendors, the very big, very wealthy vendors, to create systems so that every patient in the USA can download their clinical record from all their providers in, in a common format. Right? That's, that's just like, you roll back three years ago, that's, it's a miracle that we can have that project, we have that discussion. Um, we can't have it in Australia yet because we're all wound up in the government project that's trying to do the same thing, but it's trying to do it with total control, and they've only got one model to try, and they can't try a bunch of different models around how to make it happen. In the States, we can try one technical um, standard, and everybody is trying all sorts of different models. So, so hopefully we can break that open here in Australia too. And, and I say that, we, I work day in, day out for that project in Australia. <laughs> so, so we get to create a whole lot of new discussions. And, and I can see it now, healthcare industry is on the slide, right? They're in this place, but we've tilted the playground under them. And they're going to slide towards sharing, interoperability, combining workflows, 
and that leads to health outcomes. For the team that work around me, the 10 or 15 people, depending on how you count, who are day to day working on this, it's a moral, ethical, compelled mission. We must fix this mess. Change is coming to the healthcare industry and, and the open standard part is critical because if we didn't have an open standard, everybody would buy into the governance and the openness, people wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. All right, I'll take questions. How long have we got for questions? Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes um, and no. What? Okay, do we have anything in the standard for handling diagnostic imaging? I'm good mates with the guys from DICOM, which is the classic standard for handling that. Um, we have some, um, some things in the standard for handling the simpler DICOM stuff, the high volume, you know, CT, X-ray, there's nothing special about that anymore. It's the standard images, MRIs, they can have it. Um, so we do a, a some things, but, but we're kind of taking it slowly because the DICOM guys, are, they need some time to get their heads around the whole new ideas. Thank you very much, Mark. All right, have to be later. I'm sorry, the, um, I'm sorry, technology. We started a bit late.